But first, Duval is still reeling from Saturday's mass shooting by a white supremacist. This comes on the heels of the city council's finance committee raising questions about the necessity of a chief of diversity and inclusion for the city of Jacksonville, a new position created by Mayor Deegan. So we've asked Pravez Ahmed, chief diversity and inclusion for the city of Jacksonville, to join us to share some insight about his role and how Jacksonvillians can try to heal and work towards ensuring something like this doesn't happen again. We'd like you to join the conversation. You can call us at 549-2937. You can tweet us at FCC on air, email us at First Coast Connected WJCT, or message us on First Coast Connect's Facebook page. Um, Dr. Ahmed, before we get started, like I, I kind of want to like go back in time a little bit because um, I tend to think... I believe that um, if we look back at the past, we can kind of understand our present and our future. And the issues that are currently happening um, with uh, Mayor Deegan uh, nominating you to this new position and the city council kind of pushing back, uh, this isn't new. It isn't. Uh, but before I begin, Al, first, thank you for inviting me. I know. To I just program. dove right in. <laughs> you just dove right in. Yeah. <laughs> Forgive me. Thank you. That's thank okay. you for coming uh, on. Sure, sure. Absolutely. Uh, first, um, my, my, my heart is still broken from what happened on Saturday. Yeah. I think our minds are weary. Our hearts are broken. That these things keep on happening over and over again. Mm -hmm. It's the intersection between race and poverty. We see this over and over again. It's also the intersection between politics and polarization. And it's in that context that what the Finance Committee did made little sense to me. Yeah. It, it acted on information that was incomplete. It created a justification for cutting what the mayor wanted to do um, with data that was not fully explained. And in some sense, the data was just incorrect. Uh, the Finance Committee made the assertion that the mayor's uh, salary budget for her uh, 24 staff members that she was uh, entitled to nominate and have in her cabinet uh, increased by 30% or some other number they, they, they asserted. But the real number is actually lower. You know, uh, to compare Mayor Deegan's um, staff budget to the last year of Mayor Curry's staff budget is apples and oranges. You know, Mayor Deegan ran on a promise to, of change. Voters voted her into office despite she being outgunned in her campaign with campaign contributions two to one. Um, the change was pushed by the voters for a reason. They wanted her to enact her agenda. She promised that she would appoint a chief of diversity and inclusion. She kept her promise the city council should support her in that work. And what we saw on Saturday, I'm not saying a chief diversity officer was going to prevent that shooter, but when you look at what that shooter represents, it represents our politics of polarization. And that's what Mayor Deegan is trying to combat, promote a city that is united, that is purposeful, where we create a culture of collaboration across our differences. Yeah, uh, I think... I guess the 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 question that is uh, in my mind, uh, and the reason why I wanted to to go back to 2010, is because this all feels like it's a part of a continuum. It it feels like um, the city of Jacksonville, uh, and not just the city of Jacksonville, but I would say uh, America, <laughs> the United States of America, that we do not want to think about the past and any issues that we have around diversity and inclusion. We want to pretend that they don't exist. Uh, anybody that represents waving their hands and saying this is actually a problem that we need to talk about, uh, they tend to get pushed to the side or shut down. Uh, and then when we have <coughs> issues like, or when we have tragedies, excuse me, when we have tragedies like what happened Saturday, then everybody runs around thinking, like, how did this happen? And this can't happen in this community. But these problems are deeply rooted and have been in this community for many, many years. And the only way to tackle those problems is to actually look at it head on and dive into the, and dive into the abyss to try to make it right. That's exactly right. 
Um, what happened, just to provide your listeners a little bit of a context, in 2010, about 13 years ago, I was nominated to be on the Human Rights Commission. There was a, I would, I would characterize that as a bigoted and uninformed opposition to my nomination. Um, but ultimately, the city did the right thing. City Council did confirm me to be on the commission. I was voted back into the city commission again. And I, term, and I served two terms as the Human Rights Commissioner for the city of Jacksonville. But the process of that confirmation, the month-long process that it took me to get to the Human Rights Commission, made both headline news locally and unfortunately attracted ne- negative attention from across the country. Yeah. Um, the same thing we are seeing playing out again. Um, when, the, when the story of the shooting broke out into the national media, um, they, the national media did reference the city council's opposition to the DEI position. And the question is why? What is the, what is the reason for that opposition? All that position is trying to do is put forward a plan, a, a mechanism to fulfill a promise that Mayor Deegan made to the voters. How do we create a culture of collaboration across the differences? Jacksonville is a diverse city. Whether you like it or not, those are the facts on the ground. It is a majority-minority city. Uh, uh, Increasing, it it always had a large African-American population, increasing growth among Hispanic and Asian population. So... When I first came to the city 20 years ago, the city population was close to 65% white. Today, the city population is less than 50% white. That's how dramatically in 20 years the city has changed. All Mayor Deegan is trying to say is, given that the city is diverse, shouldn't every voice be included and presented within her administration? Shouldn't her administration push for inclusion and equity? That's what the chief diversity officer's Mm -hmm. role is to be an advisor to the mayor, to reach out to communities. And in the few weeks that I've been in position, I cannot tell you how many times I've been to community events where I heard the same phrase over and over again. This is the first time the mayor's office has attended one of our events. This is the first time we feel seen by the city. Mm -hmm. That's what it takes to build a culture of collaboration, to see people where they are, to talk to them, to find out what what concerns them and bring those concerns back to the city hall. I have a a really good friend of mine who uh, recently was uh, an applicant for a job uh, where he would be working in DEI, uh, diversity, uh, inclusion, and and engagement. Equity. Equity, excuse me. Um, uh, His role was specifically in DEI engagement, (laughs) you know, reaching out to people. And when he, told me about this i immediately told him run do not apply for that job i felt bad because i was very adamant about it and the reason why i was adamant about it is because after george floyd uh was murdered uh a host of dei work came available all over in every industry you know i i work both in uh uh, public radio, uh, podcasting, uh, I'm a TV writer, all of that stuff. And I saw in every industry that, that I touch that DEI just was everywhere. You know, people were, were clamoring to do DEI work. Fast forward several years later, and almost in every single incident, the DEI position has been eliminated. In, in Hollywood, uh, there was a day when four DEI uh, positions at four of the major companies like Netflix, uh, Disney, and a few others, uh, they cut all of those positions like in one day, like it was almost like a coordinated effort. And so it seems to me that like uh, a lot of companies, a lot of organizations uh, prioritize DEI work, but don't actually want to do the work. And then when finances get tight, they're the first person, uh, the first people to get let go. Yeah, so Al, as you know, my background is in the School of Business. I Mm -hmm. teach in the business school. Uh, My background is in finance and financial economics. So I look at it from that lens. Um, What is the value added to a company when a company engages in work related to diversity? And the answer is unequivocal. Diversity for a company, an organization, a city, 
or a university to engage in diversity work, it adds value to that company. It adds value to that, to that corporation, to that organization, to that institution. So for those who jumped on the bandwagon after George Floyd's murder, they're jumping off the bandwagon. But that was just a bandwagon effect. But those who started DEI work long before George Floyd, those who see, those who are level-headed corporate leaders, they continue to invest in DEI. JEA has a DEI position. JTA has a DEI position. All hired recently. JTA a little bit longer, but JEA was a recent hire. If you look at majority of Fortune 500 corporation, they still have their DEI position. Because those companies who understand the seriousness of the work, we are dealing with a workforce that is increasingly diverse. We are dealing with an economic climate that requires us to be nimble across different cultures. No company can avoid a faux pas. If you want to recruit the most talented people to work for you, if you want to create a culture of unity and collaboration and, and, and thriving in your communities, you have to lean into DEI. There is no arguing that we live in a diverse society. Yeah. So the only question is, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to ignore that diversity and pretend it's not there? Or are you going to harness that diversity to make it a strength and a pillar of your success? Mm -hmm. That's the question Mayor Deegan has in front of the city. <laughs> the voters answered affirmatively. They want to support Mayor Deegan on that one. Right. Now the city council needs to follow up on that. So can you lay out for me uh, exactly uh, what you do in this position and how uh, that impacts the city? So there are several ways in which my position uh, will impact the city positively. So I'm, of course, only six or eight weeks, uh, seven weeks into my job, and, and the first part of the job is just still trying to learn what the city does. But in terms of the, the areas where I've already been able to make impact, as I mentioned first, is reaching out to people in the community that have not been reached out to by city. Um, I'll give you two quick examples of it. Um, as you know, in the city, we have a large Bosnian population who came to the city after the genocide in Bosnia. There are many survivors of the Srebrenica massacre genocide where 8,000 Muslim men were killed um, during that Bosnian genocide. So recently they tried to commemorate that, that, that horrific event and have a remembrance in their community center about that event. Um, on behalf of Mayor Deegan, I, I uh, attended that event, spoke at that event, and the mayor issued a proclamation remembering the, the Srebrenica genocide. It was the first time they told me somebody from the mayor's office or any official from the city, city hall had visited that community. That community has been part of Jacksonville for well over 30 years. That's what it takes to build a culture of collaboration. Bringing communities that have been forgotten, left on the sidelines, and make them feel they're part of this vibrant, growing, diverse city. You can join the conversation at 549-2937. You can tweet us at FCC on air, First Coast Connect at WJCT.org. And you can also find us on Facebook. I think when you're, when you're talking about that example that you just gave me, it's so powerful. And I understand it uh, as, uh, as a black man living in, in, in Jacksonville. I understand the value of being in a community and that community saying to you that you have value, that we see you, we understand. Uh, we may not be able to completely wrap our head around all the struggles that you've gone through, but, but we understand that you are a part of our community and we celebrate that. Uh, Absolutely. It, 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 the idea of your city celebrating who you are is a beautiful thing. I think what happens, though, is that a lot of the people who are detractors of DEI have never really been in that position where they are not celebrated by their community, where they, they, they just they have the privilege of, you know, being the... Uh, for lack of a better term, the the uh, the target audience, right? Like they are. They always had access. Right. They've always had access. They've never had to feel like they are the outsider in their city. And so, I, I think it's a little bit of a leap. Like that's where the work is, right? Like helping people understand that just because you've always been seen doesn't mean that this community has. Exactly. 
So one of the things that the mayor had pledged is to build the city's boards and commission to reflect the diversity of the city that we live in. But we cannot, we cannot achieve that goal by waving a magic wand. It will require us to make a concerted effort to reach out to communities like the Bosnian community, like the Filipino community, like the Vietnamese community. I was recently at a Ukrainian event. Again, war refugees. We have to reach out to these communities, make them feel that they are part of it, and then motivate them to come and help the city. The boards and commissions are voluntary position. You want citizen engagement. One of the biggest complaints when I was on the Human Rights Commission is there was not enough citizen engagement. Well, part of what Mayor Deegan wants to do is change that, get people more interested. As you know, on Saturday, Mayor Deegan, um, uh, or sorry, on Sunday, Mayor Deegan appeared at the 63rd anniversary of Axe Handle Saturday, and she issued a proclamation for Axe Handle Saturday. Rodney Hurst, who was um, at the event, um, obviously, um, Rodney Hurst mentioned during the event that this is the first time somebody from the mayor's office attended Axe Handle Saturday event, a which, commemoration. Which just 63 seems, years. Yeah, that just seems... I, I have no words. <laughs> like, I literally have no words. The, the, one of the uh, major uh, turning points in this city and civil rights, uh, and no one has shown up until this mayor decided that it, exactly. was, it was important and, and, and valued. Yeah, and yesterday I was watching a new show, and... The new show led with the 63rd anniversary of Axe Handle Saturday. Yeah. It is a defining event in the life of this city. It is. And I, we had Rodney on yesterday. Unfortunately, I, I wasn't able to uh, talk to Mr. Hurst as long as I would like to because we were covering uh, the the, the uh, massacre that happened on, on Saturday. But the thing that strikes me about Axe Handle Saturday is I was an adult before I heard about it. It was not something that was taught or talked about. When, and I grew up here in Jacksonville, and I didn't hear about Axe Handle until probably 2000 when they did the uh, 40th anniversary, I think. Um, I, I, maybe that was the first time When that the I Times Union it. ran like a big story right. about it. And that's, that's true because when this incident first happened, it was not on the front pages of the Times Union. Right. It was on page 15 of Times Union. Yeah. The, the, the local newspaper ignored it for yeah. years and years and years until they started amending it and running first page stories. Just a quick story on Axe Handle Saturday. As you know, before um, I took this job, I was the director of diversity uh, for the Coggan College of Business. Sure. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was appointed after um, the, the, um, uh, George Floyd uh, the, when the university had an epiphany, they wanted to do more about DEI. Of course, all of that has been reversed with the new legislation from Tallahassee. But while I was in that position, one of the things that I tried to do was to expose my students to local history. Even business students needed to know the history of the community that they're part of. Mm -hmm. And one of the stories I, I had the students review was Axe Handle Saturday. And so many of my students who work downtown, they told me, Dr. Ahmed, we work literally blocks from that place and we never knew this incident took place. Yeah. That's how we have, and now we have this whole saga of ignoring African-American history. Yeah. Teaching slavery was a, was a jobs training program. <clears throat> yeah. All right, we're going to go to the phones. We've got Stanley in downtown. Stanley, how are you this morning? Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning. I was uh, six years old, and I was at Axe the Saturday. I stopped at the uh, Federal Reserve building when I saw women, African-American women running and crying uh, from the uh, down there at the park. But my main concern here, we are talking about everything but what really matter in this country. We, got, we have a gun problem, and we, for some reason, we will not address that. Uh, but Donna Deegan is doing a good job. I have a, some other concern, but right now is not a good time because we don't have enough time. But... Uh, everything she is doing is is is, uh, is great for this city. It's for us bringing the city together here. But uh, in closing, I'd like to say this: uh, uh, John Kennedy said uh, we need to come together as a community and help the government. 
uh, I can't get the words together here, but the, the difference in a, a, a good city and a great city is leadership. We have a leadership problem, but the community need to come downtown because I'm in City Hall 300 hours every year. And there's only two people coming downtown when it comes to civic engagement. Thank you. Stanley, thanks so much for calling in. We are talking to Dr. Parvez Ahmed, Chief Diversity of in- Chief Diversity and Inclusion for the city of Jacksonville. You can call in at 549-2937. I think uh, what Stanley brings up, the idea of uh, civil engagement and how uh, if you want the city to be better, you actually have to do something to, to make it so. You, you cannot uh, sit at home and complain if you're not out doing the work to make it better. Yeah, and we see that lack of civic engagement in our voting turnouts when we have local election voting turnout is low. Yeah. And that's an indicator that people are not as engaged as they ought to be. But that needs a proactive approach to change it. One of the things that you may have heard it because you are also out in the community as much as I am, what is the most frequent complaint people say? The city hall, we don't care what's going on. They don't care about us, yep. and thus we don't care about them. Right. So part of my job and part of the many good people that Mayor Deegan has included in her cabinet is to outreach to the community. I'm not the only one doing it on behalf of the administration. I'm just the most visible target right. in that effort. Right. Uh, but every, there are many other people engaged in that uplifting the community. People are reaching out to nonprofit for, uh, um, organizations. People are reaching out to churches, to religious institutions, to institutions that cater to our LGBTQ communities, to our veteran community, to the disabled community. We have diversity built into our communities, into our city, in so many ways. So the question in front of the city, city hall, city council, the voters of Jacksonville, is what are you going to do with this diversity that we have? In, in fact, what I would submit is my position is just the start of this work. It will require sustained investment and sustained engagement by the citizens of Jacksonville to change the story of Jacksonville. Here's a big question for you. Um, how do we heal and go forward after an event that happened uh, Saturday, after a tragedy that happened Saturday? I think we first we start the healing process by telling the truth. And the truth is, as the caller mentioned, is the story of guns, the proliferation of guns in our society. Yeah, I and, think, I, I, I think it's, I, I agree. I, I, I think it's uh, multi-layered, though. I think it's of course. Like guns. And uh, race. And race. And bo- so both stories have to be told. Right. Um, now, with guns, because it's a federal issue, it's a state issue, city does not have a, city government does not have a lot of input on that issue. Mm-hmm. But on the issue of our fractured race relations, the city does have a voice in that issue. The mayor does have a voice in the issue. The city council can do something on that issue. That's what the mayor is asking the city council to do, to step up and not keep on ignoring this problem, showing up, just giving thoughts and prayers, and then moving forward the next day as if nothing has happened. Yeah. Let me uh, just pose this to you. Uh, There are many white families uh, in this community who absolutely do not share the beliefs that uh, that the shooter had when, you know, he wrote his manifesto and and the actions that he did. They absolutely do not share his beliefs, but they also don't think that uh, this is their fight. Um, What would you say to them? So I will say to them from my own experience. After 9-11, I dealt with a lot of issues that were internal to my community. And among the issues that were internal to my community is radicalization of youth. The same method by which Many people in the leadership of Muslim community tackled this issue by confronting the truth. There is radicalization. It is incorrect to say this was a lone wolf shooter. It was not a lone wolf shooter because this person was radicalized by somebody, by some information. 
through sustained propaganda on social media and the internet and by messages from leadership trying to say that slavery was a jobs training program or we don't need to teach African American history or we don't need to uh, make people uncomfortable about our history. Well, our history is uncomfortable and we cannot ignore that history and make people feel good about it. If we gloss over the truth, we only handicap ourselves because guess what? People in kids in other states are not shying away from learning the truth. Who do we hurt in the process? Our kids in Florida have a have a competitive disadvantage because when they grow up, when they seek the top positions at the university for their education, when they seek the top jobs from the uh, to further their their careers, they're not competing from other students in Florida. They're competing from other students all across the globe, and they're learning the true history. So why are we doing this to ourselves? And that's my that's my submission to people who think that DEI is about helping the other. No, DEI is about helping us. Mm -hmm. It is about creating a toolkit, developing a skill set, so that we are all empowered to talk to each other across our differences. Dr. Parvez Ahmed, Chief Diversity, uh, Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer for the City of Jacksonville. Before I let you go, do you have any last words? Just keep on putting up the good fight. You know, right. We know, as uh, Dr. King has told us, the arc of history is long. It's long. Yeah. But it will bend towards justice. All right. And we have to keep the fight up to make it bend towards justice. All right.